with a book full on diversity through the week. I'm Erica Policy, a writer of fiction and nonfiction on policy at Big Sip America, our Erica Policy book. And today I'm going to talk about this book, Hemingway and His First 49 Short Stories. Hemingway was a particular favorite subject of mine in college, and I wrote my bachelor's thesis on Hemingway, specifically focused on the 49 stories because it shows the diversity of his writing and stories with, with women, without women, and written from women's perspectives. And it, that was better for the purpose of my thesis, which is really to focus on Hemingway and his relationship to women and whether or not feminist criticisms of him and his work were actually fair and accurate or not. And my general belief was they were not. I had a very different interpretation of him and his work. So I'm going to get into that now. So to get into Hemingway, his writing uses what is called iceberg theory, which is that there is sort of this much on the surface and that much under it. So with a lot of Hemingway's short stories, they are very short, short stories, but there is actually a lot under the words that are actually there. There's a lot more meaning behind it. Um, sometimes this is just because there was more in there and you're supposed to try to get more out of it. And, but sometimes you think it's a little bit the time period and he did have to censor a bit of what he was writing to still get it published because some of the subjects that he touches on are that controversial. And Hemingway being the kind of matter of fact person that he was with a background in journalism, he really wasn't afraid of any subject, but he sometimes had to kind of control what he was saying because it might get censored and some of his work did get censored in the times that it was published, such as in A Farewell to Arms, where the pregnancy out of wedlock was extremely controversial and the book got banned in places and it was, it was a whole controversy. But he was very uh, a matter of fact person like that. Another thing to understand about Hemingway is that he was part of the modernist movement. So the modernists basically believed in multi-perspectivity. We see this in works such as uh, Picasso's paintings. And basically, as my professor in college, the wonderful Dr. Rooney, explained to us, it's like you have a mirror in front of you and you smash it, but the glass is still in there. So you have all these different perspectives in the one image. And that was really what modernists believed in, that there wasn't just one right perspective or opinion. There were all different perspectives. And this was a totally new approach to things. They also believed that critics did not own art and what art really was. They said, we will tell you what art is. We will not have critics telling us what art is and whether or not we've created art, we will tell you if we have created art because we are the artists. He was also a part of the so-called lost generation, this post-World War I generation who in the 1920s went to parties and looked like they were having it fun, but actually they were very numb and depressed under that. They felt like they were wandering and life largely had no purpose and they were quite depressed. And there is this undertone of depression throughout Hemingway's work and throughout his life. And I'm confident that's a part of why he drank so much, although there were actually medical reasons for that as well. But it is unfortunate that he drank so much because alcohol is extremely damaging to the brain, which is a writer's greatest asset, really anyone's greatest asset, and it is damaging to every cell in the entire body. So it is highly unfortunate. But a part of why I like Hemingway's writing so much, he has this journalism background, so he's very direct and to the point a lot of the time, and every word has a purpose. I am not a big fan of flowery language. This is partly my personality. I'm a very direct person, but it is partially also because I have really had a kind of life that has been very brutal and unkind to me. So I really just don't have patience for pleasantries. I'm, that's just how I am. So I really like the way that he speaks. I will say it is generally speaking a very masculine, traditional male way to write. And I will point out 
Last season on the book show, I happened to mention in passing that I tend to prefer the way male writers write because they're kind of direct and to the point, and a lot of uh, women writers go on and on and on and on, and to me it's very irritating. So one uh, viewer whom I, I think of very well took a lot of offense to me as a woman saying this, and I think she kind of saw it as like a slam against women and was very frustrating to her when women say things like that about other women. Now, I wasn't in any way suggesting that women should change the way they write or that there's anything wrong with how they write. If that's how you want to write, that's how you want to write. Just my personal preference, my proverbial cup of tea, is that we really don't waste words and really get to the point. I really have no patience with flowery language. So to counterpoint my little critique of how a lot of women write that I just personally tend to find irritating, I will um, have a counter critique about a lot of male writers. So a lot of men will be writing about their subjects to the point that they really don't say anything about themselves and their lives and they might be the writing might be more friendly and approachable and personable if they told us a little about themselves, but sometimes you would like to know more about them. And my other piece would be sometimes they are so to the point that it's very kind of functional writing rather than instead of maybe looking at the use of the language and how you can make the language itself sound nicer. So those are just little differences there, and how you want to write is how you want to write. And I will say that tends to hold true of straight men, whereas if you read some writing by Oscar Wilde, you will see very beautiful flowery language that was basically beauty and art for the sake of beauty and art. I, I personally just don't have time for that. It's just not me, and it's not the kind of life I've had. But I didn't mean to have one little critique of how a lot of women write to sound anti-feminist. How you want to write is how you want to write, and you have every right to do your art the way you want to do it. It's just a matter of personal preference. That is all. I didn't really mean it to be taken in such a big way. And so I just wanted to kind of even that criticism out and balance things out and say there's nothing wrong with writing how you want to write. It's just a matter of personal preference if you prefer to write that way or not. So to get into Hemingway more, I'm going to read one of his short stories, On the Quay at Smyrna, which is not called Smyrna anymore. It is, if I'm pronouncing this right, Izmir in Turkey. Because of when the story was written in the 30s, you can assume he's talking about World War I. Now, some people, and by that I mean some feminists, when they read this story, they see it as, oh, he's very sexist and he's just being oh, very masculine and very brutal about things. I get a very different interpretation from the story, that he's just telling you what was there and what happened and how horrible it was and some of the horrors of wartime. You could read this and have your own interpretation that it's feminist, that it's anti-feminist, that it's this, that, and the other. You could say that it's feminist because he's talking about some of the horrible things the women are going through in this wartime. He is talking about something that's happening with uh, a lead character who is very much a traditional military male of the time, which is that he sort of has seems to have this attitude of this war being this great pursuit that makes us stronger and turns boys into men and all of that, and it's a very typical attitude of the time. Whether or not Hemingway agrees with it or not is a different matter. Maybe he is putting his own opinion on it, or maybe he's just telling you what happened as an impartial journalist. So this is Key at Smyrna. Strange thing was, he said, how they screamed every night at midnight. I do not know why they screamed at that time. We were in the harbor, and they were all on the pier, and at midnight they started screaming. We used to turn the searchlight on them to quiet them. That always did the trick. We'd run the searchlight up and down over them two or three times, and they stopped it. One time I was senior officer on the pier, and a Turkish officer came up to me in a frightful rage because one of the sailors had been most insulting to him. So I told him the fellow would be sent on ship and most severely punished. I asked him to point him out. So he pointed out a gunner's mate, most inoffensive chap said he'd been most frightfully and repeatedly insulting, talking to me through an interpreter. I couldn't imagine how the gunner's mate knew enough Turkish to be insulting. 
I called him over and said, and just in case you should have spoken to any Turkish officers. I haven't spoken to any of them, sir. I'm quite sure of it, I said. Would you best go on board ship and not come ashore again for the rest of the day? Then I told the Turk the man was being sent on board ship and would be most severely dealt with. Oh, most rigorously. There's no talking about it. Great friends we were. The worst, he said, were the women with dead babies. You couldn't get the women to give up their dead babies. They'd have babies dead for six days. Wouldn't give them up. Nothing you could do about it. Had to take them away, finally. Then there was an old lady. Most extraordinary case. I told it to a doctor, and he said I was lying. We were clearing them off the pier. Had to clear off the dead ones, and this old woman was lying on a sort of litter. They said, will you have a look at her, sir? So I had a look at her, and just then she died and went absolutely stiff. Her legs drew up, and she drew up from the waist and went quite rigid, exactly as though she had been dead overnight. She was quite dead and absolutely rigid. I told a medical chap about it, and he told me it was impossible. They were all out there on the pier, and it wasn't at all like an earthquake or that sort of thing, because they never knew about the Turk. They never knew what the old Turk would do. Do you remember when they ordered us not to come in to take off Anne's more? I had the wind up when we came in that morning. He had any amount of batteries, and he could have blown us clean out of the water. We were going to come in, run close along the pier, let go the front and rear anchors, and then shell the Turkish quarter of the town. They would have blown us out of the water, but we would have blown the town simply to hell. They just fired a few blank charges at us as we came in. Kamal came down and sacked the Turkish commander for exceeding his authority or some such thing. He got a bit above himself. It would have been the hell of a mess. You remember the harbor. There are plenty of nice things floating around in it. That was the only time in my life I got so I dreamed about things. We didn't mind the women who were having babies as we did those with the dead babies. They had them all right, surprising how few of them died. We just covered them over with something and let them go at to it. They'd always pick out the darkest place in the hold to have them. None of them minded anything once they got off the pier. The Greeks were nice chaps, too. When they evacuated, they had all their baggage animals. They couldn't take off with them, so they just broke their forelegs and dumped them into the shallow water. All those mules with their forelegs broken pushed over into the shallow water. It was all a pleasant business. My word, yes, a most pleasant business. So some people see that story as being sexist and very masculine and very brutal. That's one way you could see it. You could also see it as Hemingway pointing out how brutal it was and therefore showing a sympathy to what the women and the civilians in wartime are going through. Or you could see it simply as Hemingway reporting on something that happened that someone was talking to him about your personal biases and preferences are going to read a lot into it, particularly with that iceberg theory. If that's what he said, what is the rest of down there? We're not quite sure because it is obscure. My view that that story is much more about the suffering of civilians in wartime than any glorification of all of this I think is backed up by another of Hemingway's short stories called The Old Man at the Bridge, which is in the context of civilians fleeing the war in civil war-torn Spain during the 1930s. An old man with steel-rimmed spectacles and very dusty clothes sat by the side of the road. There was a pontoon bridge across the river and carts, trucks, and men, women, and children were crossing it. The mule-drawn carts staggered up the steep bank from the bridge, with soldiers helping push against the spokes of the wheels. The trucks ground up and away, heading out of it all, and the peasants plodded along in the ankle-deep dust. But the old man sat there without moving. He was too tired to go any farther. It was my business to cross the bridge, explore the bridgehead beyond, and find out to what point the enemy had advanced. I did this and returned over the bridge. There were not so many carts now and very few people on foot, but the old man was still there. Where do you come from? I asked him. From San Carlos, he said and smiled. That was his native town, and so it gave him pleasure to mention it, and he smiled. I was taking care of animals, he explained. Oh, I said, not quite understanding. Yes, he said, I stayed, you see, taking care of animals. I was the last one to leave the town of San Carlos. 
He did not look like a shepherd nor a herdsman, and I looked at his black, dusty clothes and his gray, dusty face and his steel-rimmed spectacles and said, What animals were they? Various animals, he said, and shook his head. I had to leave them. I was watching the bridge and the African-looking country of the Ibero Delta and wondering how long now it would be before we would see the enemy and listening all the while for the first noises that would signal that ever mysterious event called contact. And the old man still sat there. What animals were they, I asked. There were three animals altogether, he explained. There were two goats and a cat. And, and then there were four pairs of pigeons. And you had to leave them, I asked. Yes, because of the artillery. The captain told me to go because of the artillery. And you have no family, I asked, watching the far end of the bridge where a few last carts were hurrying down the slope of the bank. No, he said, only the animals, I stated. The cat, of course, will be all right. A cat can look out for itself. And I cannot think of what will become of the others. What politics have you, I asked. I am without politics, he said. I am 76 years old. I have come 12 kilometers now. And I think now I can go no further. This is not a good place to stop, I said. If you can make it, there are trucks up the road where it forks for Tortosa. I will wait a while, he said, and, and then I will go. Where do the trucks go? Towards Barcelona, I told him. I know no one in that direction, he said, but thank you very much. Thank you again very much. He looked at me very blankly and tiredly, then said, having to share his worry with someone, The cat will be all right, I am sure. There is no need to be unquiet about the cat, but the others. And what do you think about the others? Why, they'll probably come through it all right. You think so? Why not, I said, watching the far bank, where now there were no carts. But what will they do under the artillery when I was told to leave because of the artillery? Did you leave the dove cage unlocked, I asked? Yes. Then they'll fly. Yes, certainly they'll fly. But the others, it's better not to think about the others, he said. If you are rested, I would go, I urged. Get up and try to walk now. Thank you, he said, and got to his feet, swayed from side to side, and then sat down backwards in the dust. I was taking care of animals, he said dully, but no longer to me. I was ta only taking care of animals. There was nothing to do about him. It was Easter Sunday, and the fascists were advancing toward the Ebro. It was a gray, overcast day with a low ceiling, so their planes were not up. That and the fact that cats know how to look after themselves was all the good luck that old man would ever have. My take on this story is, is that it is very sympathetic to the suffering of civilians who are caught up in these conflicts, particularly because this old man, he's, he has no politics. He's minding his own business. For whatever reason, he doesn't have family. And he's just looking after these animals and minding his own business. And now because these other people decided, who have their politics, decided to have a war, his whole life is completely thrown to the wind and he just doesn't even want to go on any further. I see this as showing a sympathy towards what people are going through in wartime, and that is what I get out of it. You can, of course, get your own interpretation out of it, but I certainly don't see Hemingway as someone who, from his writing, looks like he's pro-war and oblivious to the suffering that it causes. I think he's very painfully aware of the suffering that it causes. I was very fortunate in college that I had professors who really loved it when you took an idea and ran with it and were passionate about it and made it your own. Um, they were generally more interested in that than in just regurgitating what you've been told. Now, regurgitation might work okay for um, some of what you did in your exams because all the exams in Ireland are essay-style exams. Multiple choice is seen as cheating in Ireland, and frankly, that's the way it should be. Multiple choice questions on a test, they do not lead to critical thinking and real comprehension and retention of the information. Um, like when I was taking my Praxis exam this year, so I could qualify to teach in the United States. 
you cram for your exam, you pass it, and then you tend to forget most of what it was you learned. Whereas when you're having to do essay style exam, you will retain more of it because you have to do some original analysis, some of your own independent thinking. But to a certain extent, the exams were a little bit of that, regurgitate the knowledge, but our research papers had to have a lot of original critical thinking in them. And my professors were very good about really loving it when you took an idea and made it your own whether they were the first person to suggest the idea or not, that you had really your own take on it. So to delve even more deeply into this subject, I want to go into the introduction for my bachelor's thesis, which I call the argument for reconsidering Hemingway and his work, a response to popular feminist criticism. Hemingway was a very successful writer in the early to mid 20th century. Then in the 1970s, as what came to be known as second wave feminism began, many critics, particularly women, began to criticize his works and him as a person. In some ways, it is understandable that feminists, especially women, chose to criticize Hemingway and his work. When faced with centuries of oppression at the behest of male chauvinists who always privileged male perspectives and experiences, it is not surprising that many women would seek to tear down a popular masculine icon. In some ways, this could mean that Hemingway and his writings were essentially the victims of a much larger social issue. The second wave feminism of the 1970s could seem vitriolic towards certain men and patriarchal institutions. However, we must remember that this was a response to vitriol against women, an absolute in oppression of women and women's ideas and women's opportunity for educations and all of that that comes with it. Their feminist forebears, such as Simone de Beauvoir and Virginia Woolf, were contemporaries of Hemingway. In fact, Hemingway's Women Who Hunt and Fish can remind us of de Beauvoir's assertion that sex and gender are distinctly different and that one is not born but rather becomes a woman when society decides what is female or male. This is mentioned in A History of Feminist Literary Criticism. Through the 1970s, the focus in feminism increasingly moved to literary representation of women by and for women. This is mentioned in A History of Feminist Literary Criticism. There were extremely few women authors writing about women or anything before then. This makes it all the more unusual and important that Hemingway wrote about women and that these women were often strong, independent, and skilled. Interestingly, these notions of gender and sex differences were actually part of Hemingway's childhood. Many feminists saw only Hemingway's popular image as a bravado male and they typically found it offensive. He is often seen as an example of the ultimate macho man who was, if anything, happy about war, killing, fishing and hunting, and privileging all things masculine. Some critics say that his macho persona was a harsh response to the fact that in early childhood, his mother sometimes dressed him as a girl and called him Ernestine. And we're not really sure why. This fact started to make Ernest feel a kind of hatred toward women. So say certain authors, a semi, uh, Sayesh Jabrili, Sheikh Saadi, and Hajj Mohammadian. I apologize for butchering names. In fairness, plenty of people butcher my last name and I let it go. Statements like this, however, involve acting as if we can get into another person's head. We cannot. We cannot know what someone else was thinking or feeling throughout their life. We can only make educated guesses. In fact, even when someone tells us directly, this is what I was thinking and feeling, we don't necessarily know if that's accurate. Thus, we should not attempt to act or speak as if we can get into someone else's head. And it is possible that his early experiences of gender play and costuming taught him the idea of gender as theater the idea that gender, not biological sex, is social costuming. That comes from Zavellos. Many critics of Hemingway have discussed his many short stories and books as a theatrical display of masculine behavior and codes of conduct. So says Strykatz in Hemingway's Theaters of Masculinity. 
Thus, his public image as the ultimate macho male who publicly stated that he was especially proud to have sons may have been his own conscious creation. In private, Hemingway said he always wished he had a daughter. So said Morera in Hemingway on the China Front, which was a very interesting book, uh, largely about Hemingway and Gellhorn. That persona served him well in his career in his era. He was popular with both men and women in his time and freed him up to write about anything he wanted. For example, homosexual characters in Fiesta, The Sun Also Rises, and some of his short stories such as The Sea Change. He wrote about strong women such as Pilar in For Whom the Bell Tolls. And we can point out here that he gave her the greatest compliment he could have, which was to say that she was a great storyteller. And he named his sport fishing boat after her, the Pilar. He wrote what he liked without anyone ever questioning his masculinity or his sexuality. If his public image was wholly intentional, then it was an excellent strategic move for someone who wanted a very strong and lasting career in the public eye in that era. More recent accounts of Hemingway and his life paint a very different picture of Hemingway than the one-dimensional, insensitive, bravado caricature he was and is usually perceived as, as portrayed as recently as the 2012 somewhat uh, very historically inaccurate HBO film Hemingway and Gellhorn. The book Hemingway and Love, written by his close friend A.E. Hotchner and published in 2015, explores a more sensitive side to his character. For example, when Hemingway is talking about his very painful separation from his first wife Hadley and his son Jack, affectionately nicknamed Bumby, he says that Hemingway borrowed a cart, a hand cart from the sawmill, and he's moving Hadley's things back to her place and he ends up crying and his son asks him why he's crying and he shows a cut on his hand and he says oh your dad just got hurt that's why i'm crying and his son lovingly goes and gets and puts a bandage on it which makes him cry even more because he's really broken up about this separation and how he's not going to be living with his son and seeing him as much and all of that this shows another dimension to Hemingway's character, one which he chose to keep out of the public eye during his lifetime. In the preface, the author states, Over the ensuing years, I would observe Ernest's gentle patience with young people like myself in memorable times. In my case, for example, I had no military training in firearms. I was a flop at wing shooting, but Ernest patiently led me to proficiency in jump shooting mallards. The more our friendship grew, the more I realized that the stories that had circulated about his gruff, pugnacious personality were a myth invented by people who didn't know him but judged him by the subjects he wrote about. He would stand up to any transgressor, yes, but I never saw him as an aggressor. That's from Hotchner. Additionally, some have said that he and his fourth wife, Mary Welsh, experimented with gender role reversals in bed. In Linda Wagner Martin's book, Ernest Hemingway, A Literary Life, in 2007, the author notes that Welsh, Welsh grew up homesteaded in the very small and rural Minnesotan town of Bemidji. Yes, Bemidji, Minnesota, where my very own grandma Colopy was from. I love Bemidji. I've been there. It's a really nice little town. It's a really nice place full of really nice people. Anyway, near Ojibwe American Indians, uh, like Hemingway did, and she was essentially her father's son. That's Wagner Martin, page 150. Mary was a journalist like a second, and fourth wives Pauline Pfeiffer and Martha Gellhorn, which could suggest that Hemingway was seeking an equal. Mary's childhood as a tomboy shows a gender role reversal, especially when counterposed with Hemingway's childhood experiences of being dressed as a girl for no apparent reason. In fact, many critics strongly suggest they did gender role reversal in sex play, and Mary herself said they were, and I quote, androgynous in bed. That's from Latham. Wagner Martin, a well-known critic on Hemingway, seems to both appreciate and dislike Hemingway and is very sympathetic towards Welsh and Gelhorn. In her book, she sometimes includes a feminist interpretation of things. This means that she and Hotchner are a good juxtaposition for researching Hemingway as each has a clear and opposite bias for and against him. Her book offers some valuable insights into Hemingway's life, 
in spite of its biases against him. The biggest problem with this biography is the writer's dubious and egotistical tendency to write as if she can be in Hemingway's head. For example, when she writes, and I quote, in his mind, the only reason Pauline would leave Arkansas would be to join him. That's Wagner Martin, 66. If the book had begun with a preface stating that the author thought writing with this kind of authority was, in her opinion, good for the flow and continuity of a book, but that she recognized no one can ever really be in someone else's head, this would be fine. But since she didn't write any such disclaimer, it's ludicrous. She comes across as wholly irritated with Hemingway for an imagined thought, which he may or may not have actually thought. I bring this up not to criticize this very talented writer, she is very talented, um, but to draw attention to a common problem that arises when we try to analyze any person or work. We must be careful of how much we assume to know about someone or their work. This is very important to consider when we discuss popular criticism of Hemingway and his work. Most popular opinions of him today are based on analyzations of him and his work done by people that never knew him and made their careers out of espousing feminist views that were directed at breaking down the privileging of male and masculine people and behaviors. And they may have had their own reasons for this. They may have had good reasons. I don't want to come in as a woman after their time period who's benefited from the work that they've done by breaking down some of those stereotypes. I'm just saying that when you have people who have a clear bias, an agenda, a particular motivation, you're not going to get an unbiased, extremely reliably accurate account of things. You are getting that bias and they, they may have done that for good reasons or thought they were doing it for really good reasons. So I'm not going to criticize that too much. I'm just saying we're not necessarily getting anything of accuracy when there's so much clear bias in it. Just like before the feminist movement, you had so much blatant bias against women of these people, say in the 1800s with their opinions, oh, oh, women are so weak and emotional and can't handle things. And even into the, the 20th century, uh, my sister's best friend had a high school teacher who said women shouldn't be in the military and couldn't be in war times because they can't handle blood. And she raised her hand and said, what about all the women nurses who had to help with the amputations and were covered in blood? And yeah, he did not like her and she didn't get a good grade in the class, even though she was plainly thinking critically. But a lot of teachers think that teaching is, my opinion is the only right opinion, and those teachers are wrong. Your job as a teacher is to help your students think critically and form their own opinions so they can achieve their own full potential. But anyway, getting back to Hemingway. It is easy for humans to be biased and to project biases and preconceived notions into the things they study and difficult for us to remove personal biases from our thoughts and actions. For example, the author claims Hemingway's short story, Now I Lay Me, expressed animosity towards women. That's Wagner Martin. That is one interpretation. However, another way of interpreting the story is that it does not express animosity towards women, but indifference. As the narrator claims the memory of all women runs together, it reminds me of what many older women say about men, that all men are the same. In my experience, as people get older, they often state that all of the opposite sex are the same. This is, of course, not factually true, but if written into a story, it isn't necessarily meant to be. And it is important to note here that if a woman said something to this effect about men, probably no one would get offended. But the double standard is that men supposedly cannot make statements to this effect without it being some kind of attack on women, which frankly is women actually being sexist against women in a way because they're basically putting a lot of weight and consideration into what men are saying. And well, he said that and he said that and we can't have that. Why do you care so much what men are saying? Why do you think it's that important? Maybe it's not that important what men say. Um, I had a boss in the past year that would say a lot of things that sounded very sexist and it would offend other women and I understood why. Usually when he would make those statements, I'd laugh it off and continue to go about my job. In some ways it was irritating, in some ways it was kind of funny because he, he genuinely recognized that I was one of the smartest employees there and I really helped him to look good in his managerial role. He appreciated me. He tried to get me um, a pay increase when he could. 
but he would make these statements that were just really not politically correct, but I could laugh them off because I was busy getting back into teaching and getting my qualifications to teach in the United States. So I kind of ignored it because I didn't matter that much to me. And a lot of other women that worked with him did not ignore it and would get really offended. And I understood why, but at the same time, I'm kind of standing there thinking, who cares what he's saying? So a man said a thing, why do you care that much? Maybe it's not that important. It's not like he's the leader of a country saying something like that. He's just a manager. Maybe it's not that important. Maybe we don't need to care that much what men are saying. Just saying. So as this demonstrates, there are many different ways of interpreting things. For example, Hemingway is often seen as sexist. Uh, Wagner Martin's book and in other biographical sources because he went on safari, that uh, one safari that was men only, thus excluding his then wife, Pauline. However, he went on his first safari with her, paid for by her rich uncle, and he went on later safaris with Mary, his, his other wife. According to Hotchner's book, which was made from conversations he had with Hemingway, he chose to have one men only safari in order to get a break from his unhappy marriage with Pauline. That does not necessarily mean he was just overall a very sexist person that wanted to keep women out of things. He went on the safari with women. Additionally, throughout history, throughout all cultures, it is considered normal for when men and women to periodically do things with members of the same sex only and get a break from the other sex. This is seen in books such as Dr. Leonard Sachs's Why Gender Matters. This doesn't mean everyone secretly hates all members of the other sex. A man can want to bond with other men without hating women and vice versa. We must consider that when women write about experiences that only females can have, such as pregnancy and childbirth, they are not then accused of hating men and being absolutely against men. Some critics have said Hemingway was a misogynist because of how Catherine dies in A Farewell to Arms. It is interesting to note that Wagner Martin states that Hemingway said he did not know how a farewell to arms would end and contemplated Catherine and her baby both living, one or the other living, or both dying. That there's a good chance the news of his father's death was what really affected his opinion to have them both die. Wagner Martin, page 8. Another way of interpreting this event in the story is that it privileges women's unique issues. In a war drama, he demonstrated that pregnancies and childbirth can be just as deadly as battlefields. In my view, her death shows respect for women's struggles and gives them equal status to men's struggles. Um, because in World War I, you didn't have any women in the battles themselves. So we have to put it in the context of the time period. Interestingly, the characters having a pregnancy out of wedlock was so scandalous in the time that the final installment in Scribner's was banned in New York, which ironically created greater publicity and book sales. So says Wagner Martin. This important point was changed for the film version where they have a secret marriage. This could be interpreted as Hemingway being a feministic in telling the truths of women's lives. He also did this at the start of the novel by showing the uniquely harsh stigma attached to women who have premarital sex, as one nurse is being dismissed in disgrace and almost no one will even speak to her. And when I say that, I mean she's in a dorm style living situation with the other nurses and the other nurses, the females, will not speak to her. And he showed respect and appreciation for women in their wartime job in that era, that of being a nurse, watching men die, helping doctors, amputating men's limbs, and nursing patients back to health. This is very important given that not censoring the many facts of women's lives, often their sex lives or health issues related to female anatomy, has long been a crucial part of the feminist movement. Speaking the truths of women's lives is an act of feminism, and it's something Hemingway was not afraid to do. For example, in Hills Like White Elephants, he talks around abortion. Again, in that time period, there's sometimes he could not directly write about something. 
in Sheti di Se La Patria. I probably just butchered that Italian, but anyway, and the light of the world, he speaks frankly and in a non-judgmental manner about prostitutes. In the latter, the two protagonists have a friendly and mostly non-sexual conversation with the women prostitutes at the train station. In For Whom the Bell Tolls, he talks about or around rape and privileges this female trauma as equal to men's traumas in wartime. Additionally, rape is mentioned in A Way You'll Never Be when Nick Adams is viewing all the papers strewn on a battlefield with the dead bodies. He notes that the propaganda pictures portraying the enemy as rapists are unrealistic. They are designed to look sexually tantalizing when in reality, as the story makes clear, rape is actually brutal, dehumanizing, and life-threatening. The issue of rape in wartime is one that many novels, films, and TV shows today and documentaries don't even address. Many uh, historical books to help you learn about history don't even touch on the subject, which is completely historically inaccurate. And um, I'm aware that rape is not just a women's issue, but in this context of what he's talking about in the stories, it is only mentioned in terms of it being a women's issue. Hemingway's willingness to discuss women's unique struggles and traumas was an act of feminism, whether intentional or not. Being honest about the simple truths of women's bodies, women's traumas, and women's lives is an issue that has long been at the forefront of feminism and is still at the forefront of it today. It used to be considered quite scandalous when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony's writing partner in the feminist movement in the United States, would hang a kind of flag outside her small town home to announce the births of her children. In her time, a birth was considered a private moment that should not be spoken of in public, as with all aspects of women's private lives and anatomy. That's Burns and Barnes. In the past decade, prominent U.S. feminist activist and writer Jennifer Baumgardner has struggled immensely to get women, and sometimes their male partners, to speak up about having the procedure of an abortion. She began an I Had an Abortion campaign to get women to speak up about it and wear t-shirts with that line on them, intentionally like a scarlet letter. Whether women keep or terminate their unwanted pregnancies was and is considered a taboo subject, while the truths of men lives are not considered taboo. That's Baumgartner. This demonstrates that Hemingway and his work were sometimes ahead of their time when it came to women. As we have seen, there are different ways of interpreting the same things or people. Inevitably, all of us have a tendency to project preconceived notions into what we come in contact with unless we work very diligently to become more self-aware. Additionally, we have a strong tendency to be influenced by our teachers, um, particularly if they were good and encouraged us and did the proper job of being a teacher. Thus, it can be difficult to avoid simply regurgitating their opinions. I would say our parents and other main influencers as well. Lastly, before attempting to interpret someone or their work, we must put them in the proper context. Their time period and the ideas and social values people were raised with in that time. I should add culture as well. Hemingway was writing in a pre-second wave feminism era. In Ernest Hemingway, A Literary Life, we get a glimpse into what another literary man of Hemingway's time and talent as a writer thought about his book, A Farewell to Arms and its Treatment of Women. Scott Fitzgerald read the manuscript and conscientiously gave Ernest a full critique. He found Catherine's dialogue and demeanor unbelievable and long. If Hemingway were to cut anything, he said, he should cut her speeches and not Frederick's. He then advised Ernest to listen to women as he had done in Hills Like White Elephants and Cat in the Rain. He thought the novel should stay with the war instead of drifting off into what he called the old story of the unmarried and pregnant woman. Hemingway appears comparatively caring of and insightful into women's lives and the problems they face when put in the proper context. Given all of that, I think it is fair to say that Hemingway and his work deserve to be reconsidered. 
And over the next three chapters, I demonstrated a different view on Hemingway, a different way they could be looked at. And I could be right, I could be wrong. You can't know exactly what was in Mr. Hemingway's head. But all of that being said, I think it's important to go back to my earlier point of saying, why do so many women still put so much weight into what men say? One thing, if it's a world leader you're talking to or someone like that, who is going to have that much of an influence over many people's lives, including those of women, and if he doesn't have any understanding or appreciation of women's struggles, this is a major issue. But if it's just kind of some random guy, why do you care so much? I think you should care more about your own opinion. So thank you for watching the book show on Diversity TV and we will be happy to see you next time for this show or any of our other wonderful programs on Diversity TV. Thank you and have a great day.